Okay, there we go. It's amazing what the mute button will do. All right. Welcome back, everybody. I'm going to give those guys about 30 seconds to walk in, and we're going to close the doors. So if anybody's back there that can man the doors for me. There's a few ladies making their way back in. I'm not going to be rude and ruin it for them. We're a little bit behind schedule, but that's okay. That pastor sure knows how to talk a long time. It's all good. Okay. If we can close that back door right there. Hop, hop. It's, it's those Germans. There we go. I'll let you guys get settled in. As we're doing that, I just want to say, again, thank you for being here. Uh, I'm going to make the announcement right now. I don't know of any place that you can go to, especially, say, an amphitheater, and take your own guitar with you and demand to be put up on stage with the band. Has anybody ever experienced that except for open mic night? Okay. So I just want that to be clear. I'm, I'm not mad. Nobody's mad. Nobody's angry. But I'm going to be stern about it. Because a lot of work went into this. A lot of work. So if you don't agree with something, that's fine. You've got a constitutional right to say something, but do it in a way that's not going to cause a disturbance for the rest of the people. It's that simple. <laughs> Enough said. But if anybody has a guitar... Okay, now I want to. I want to. This is this is my little special moment here, and not just mine. Um, and first and foremost, I'd like you all to. Uh, I haven't talked to him since this morning, and he called me in a frantic position. But many of you may know a guy by the name of Mike Cavanaugh. Okay, uh, just a little bit ago, and I would I would just ask this. I would just keep his his uh, wife and uh, baby on the way in prayer. She was having some pains this morning, and she's about to pop. So I just want to say. You know, keep her in prayer. She's not the biggest of ladies, and she's got a big baby in her, so <laughs> we hope everything's all right. Um, speaking of Mike, shortly after Rob Skeeb and I did the uh, Lake Michigan test, the Mirage test, and uh, proved that it wasn't a Mirage, it was just a nice big lensing effect thanks to humidity. Well, this guy reached out to me and said, I got an idea. I'm like, okay. And then he, I found out he's got a bunch of ideas. And I started seeing the work he was doing. The next thing, we're talking a lot. Then I started talking to this guy named, uh, chatting back and forth with Steve Torrance. And then this guy named Dr. Zach. And then these other guys jumped in. And then these gals jumped in. And it turned into this big thing. And it's turned into this thing called FE Core. Well, what is that? And I'm proud to announce that there's some major stuff happening at the real, truly official level now. And everyone can be a part of it to where we actually go and do exactly what we should do and erase the dogma in science. Go ahead and roll the video. If you guys have it queued up, they don't have it ready. Okay. Now they have it ready. The biggest scientific delusion of all is that science already knows all the answers. Rupert Sheldon. Since the late 1800s, science has been shifting from discovery to dogma. Dogma is a belief. Science is discovery based upon reason and repeatable observations. When science is dogmatic, its goal is to defend a theory. When an established theory judges the validity of new observations, scientific discovery ends. In 1895, mainstream science taught that flight by heavier-than-air machines was impossible. Thankfully, two mechanics, Orville and Wilbur Wright, didn't believe the dogma. They didn't turn to the mainstream science establishment for funding and were successful at being the first to make fixed wing flight possible. In recent years, we see the mainstream propping up theories with mental constructs devoid of any evidence or data. Tens of thousands are aware of this intellectually bankrupt practice. 
pavilion suffer from the stagnation that it creates. It's time for the scientific research field to be unencumbered. Today we announce the formation of Field Engineers Corps, an international group dedicated to true scientific discovery, free of dogmatic agenda. FE Corps is a nonprofit organization of talented individuals devoted to discovering truth. We will expand knowledge beneficial to all people by bringing together expertise, dedication, and funding to conduct purposeful scientific observations. FE Corps is research based upon actual observation and not assumptions. The result will be proven facts. These new facts will result in a myriad of benefits to all our Earth. It's time to challenge the status quo and remove the veil of pseudoscience. Please deposit 35 cents. Okay. I wanted to talk about this yesterday so bad. Yes, FE Core is happening. And I want to bring some guys up. If you are here and you are part of FE Core, if you are seriously part of this, everybody come up. Bob Nodell, Jaron, Dee Dee, where'd you go? I know you're here. Where'd you go? Karen, where are you at? You guys got to come up. This is, a, this is a group. We've been working on things kind of quietly, not telling everybody. You guys can't talk while I'm on this thing. There you go. Okay. These guys, and I'll, I'm going to let Bob talk for a second and, and Jaron as well. Uh, this whole project, about a year, I would say a little over a year, I, I had called Jaron and we had discussed some, some uh, tests that we wanted to do. Rob and I had done the Lake Michigan test. Then we got invited to go down to Victor Brewer. Where's Ski Bat? You back there, brother? Okay. And we, Rob called me and said, we're going to go do these balloon tests. I'm like, are you serious? I want to go. He's like, yeah, we're going to go. We became balloon chasers. It's a phenomenal experience. And then these minds all got to, Cammie, thank you. And I just, I just got to say, I'm humbled. <laughs> yeah. Humbled. Because. Love you too. It's all good. So many of you have been through so much pain over this topic that's so stupid. And it's the handiwork of God that we're trying to show and break the dogmatic indoctrination. And I do believe this, it's satanic at the core. So we're bringing a group together. We brought a group together and I do believe it's God doing this. And you're looking at people that have been passionate and have gone through a lot. And I apologize to you because you don't know it and I said bad things about you. I'm sorry. Bob, I respect you. I'm excited, man. I'm excited. It's real. This ain't fake. And you're not gonna see other people having the type of emotion and drive than what you see in this group right here and the group that are overseas. So I wanna say Steve Torrance, Dr. Zach, Sandor, if I'm missing anybody, tell me. Mike Cavanaugh, obviously Mike Cavanaugh. This is who FE Core is going to be and who we are. And if you want to learn more, if you want to learn more, go to fecore.org. Send an email, fecore.org. The website is up. And for those of you watching on the live stream, thank you for contributing to what Robbie's put together, what the team's put together. This is going to be changing. And like I've told everybody along this way, this is some serious stuff, guys. What we're embarking on, and I ask you all to pray over us, pray over what this organization is going to be and what it already is. I just ask for your prayers, please. Thank you. So, Bob, I want you to, if you want to say something, if you guys want to say something, Jaron, anybody, if you guys want to say something, now's our time we can speak or hold on to it. But I just, I really, truly believe that God has put this in all of our laps and on our hearts and on our minds more importantly and once again i bring up proverbs 20 12 the hearing ear and the seeing eye the lord hath made even both of them and none of us turn that switch on on our own none of us have turned the switch on to continuously want to learn to find out truth and that's why when i say 
Some of us aren't there yet. It's not that I have it all figured out. It's that he knows what he's doing in all of our lives. And we don't know everything. But that's what Epicor that is about. We want to find out answers. We want to help change. It's not just about Flat Earth. It's about all kinds of products. Learning. So, yeah, I just thank all of you. Thank you. Thank you, God. Thank everybody for this and this opportunity. So, yeah, if you want to say something. Yeah. Yes. Please, Bob. Sorry. Well, well, first of all, thank you, everybody, for being here. This is terrific. Um, we uh, started working on the Flat Earth, uh, excuse me, the Field Engineer Corps group. It's a little difficult to do this uh, with the EPI, and we get it mixed up. But we started on this a few months back, and uh, we've really been trying to rush to put it together so we can announce it at the conference. And uh, it's it's going to be a terrific organization. We're going to have some fantastic experiments uh, that are be coming up. The best part about it is that uh, we will be able to take submissions from you, the community, because uh, I know there's a lot of you people out there that have some fantastic ideas uh, about what we can do to prove the shape of the Earth, whether it be flat, ball, or anything. I mean, we know it's flat, but we need to we need to kind of present that to the world. So, okay. Um, Oh, all right. That was on a minute. The sun? No. All right. Whoa. <laughs> Can you hear me now? <laughs> All right. So anyway, yeah, we, we really labored to get this put together um, for this for this conference. And we have a lot of fantastic people involved, a lot of really smart uh, engineers and technical people uh, ranging everywhere from uh, agricultural experts to uh, engineering, mechanical, electrical, um, all kinds of disciplines. And we're always looking for uh, great people to bring into the organization. So. This is gonna be the chance where we have to be able to do our science and present it to the world and uh, just show show the world what we're really made of. So I'm really excited about it. It's gonna be super great. So thanks everybody. And I'll talk about it a little bit more during the Goldbuster show. And uh, we'll uh, kick off the show here in just a minute. Right, sure. Yeah, just saying thank you. And it's an awesome uh, honor to be a part of such a group uh, Dr. Zach, Mike Cavanaugh, people that I have watched and respected. And when they asked me, I couldn't be more humbled to be a part of it. And uh, it took a lot of work for us to get ready. And we are, uh, you know, 501c3 and to get it all pushed through and get it to the IRS is not an easy job. If any of you have ever had to go through that process, it's not as easy as you might think. And, you know, you're talking 75 pages of paperwork that need to be uh, crafted in your bylaws and it's just uh, a lot more work than any of us thought and uh, you know it's just exciting to be a part of something that is going to help us find the truth that we can talk about all day long but if we're not out there proactively researching experimenting then uh, we're really doing nothing different than the theoretical physicists who are just uh, making shit up so <laughs> I'm glad that we're going to be doing something uh, positive and different Karen you have something to say? Anybody? Yeah, you? Cammie? <laughs> Hi, and I'm not used to being with a microphone, but I just want to thank everybody in support of just giving us the opportunity to learn and to test and to go forward. It's it's what we dream of. It's what our dream of is taking it forward. So thank you, the whole core group and everything putting together to give us a way to actually perform the experiments and come up with real solutions to answers to what we're looking for. So thank you so much, everyone. Um, I don't really know what to say, but I, I'm just happy to be here and I'm happy to see, you know, everybody here and the vibe here has been really great. And, um, and I think it's wonderful. And, you know, a long time ago, somebody that was really close to me asked me, you know, why, why are you involved in this? Why do you care about this? You know, what do you expect to happen? And I thought about it for a minute. And, you know, the only thing I could say is that I expect the world to change. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and I think we're going to do that. That's it. That's it.
All right. Thank you, Karen. Karen's our secretary, by the way. And she is busting her butt. So thank you so much on that. All right. Without further ado, once again, FE Core is official. It's happening. And uh, look out. Look out, science with a capital S, because we're bringing the little s in. And we're going to observe. And we're going to second guess. And we're going to check. And we're going to collect data. And you guys can all be a part of it. So learn more at fecore.org. Send an email. Get involved. Thank you, guys. Told myself I wasn't going to do that. I'm tough. So, it was, I, you know it was? You guys shook my hand. You had garlic on your hand and the whole thing. I, I hang out with cops. I'm cool. So I gave real something. All right. All right. Now, I, I will say this. Uh, these guys, obviously, um, I feel like I'm family with these guys. I really do. And I just I finally got to meet them. But I'm excited because we get to actually we get, get to see them do their thing live. Pretty cool. So without further ado, can we can we roll the intro? To the Globusters intro. Globusters coming up right here. I'm so excited about this. So roll the intro. Here we go, guys. If there's something strange and it don't look good, who you gonna call? Live from across the plane, still struggling through Google Hangouts, comes the coolest guys you've ever met. Oops, wrong show. Comes the guys who may be weird, who may not be mainstream, and who may believe in things many might call crazy. But these guys are after the truth, and sometimes the truth is the craziest thing you've ever heard. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is the Globe Flanders. Okay, so huh? you can hear me. All right, beautiful. All right, well, welcome everybody. Um, this is this is a rare occasion, Globebusters Live. So uh, we're really happy to be here, and uh, I come here with my two co-hosts. Sorry about that. Got to get used to the microphone. Uh, my two co-hosts, uh, Jaren from the Jaronism Channel, and today we have with us Irul Anducci, who is our our newest Globebuster. <laughs> so yeah, this is this is really uh, an amazing thing for us to be here. We're we're just pleased as punch to be here. So we'll go ahead and start it off and uh, take it and take it from here. So we'll start off with Flat Earth Clues, part 33, Rendezvous in Raleigh. Oh, oh, whoops, wrong show. All right, sorry about that. Okay. Anyway, um, so 
I'm going to start off with a couple of things. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit um, uh, about you know my journey here, and we're going to go over some of the um, more of the common sense arguments I think that uh, we like to make uh, on Globusters, and we try and appeal to a lot of people's common sense along with doing some of the science with it. But a lot of people wonder how we're you know they ask us a lot how do we approach our Glober friends and what are some of the best arguments that we can make for them. And so we've kind of put together a few things that we're going to be looking at and uh, we're going to go over those. So, so we'll kick it off here. So flat earth. So what in the world would make people go back to believing that the world is flat when everybody knows that the earth's a globe spinning, right? We all know it's, we all know it's not moving, but uh, a lot of people question our beliefs and they wonder where we're coming from when we do that. So, I suppose that it helps uh, if you have looked into a lot of other conspiracies um, and other events in history, and you kind of come to the understanding that much of what we've been taught uh, and, and what we've been brought to believe in is largely an obfuscation at best and an outright lie at worst, right? So when you kind of think that way, um, it, it separates you from the crowd. I know that for me personally, that line of thinking has undoubtedly labeled me as a full-fledged tinfoil hat wearing conspiracy theorist. <laughs> You're not alone. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, I could True. be that too, right? <laughs> Aluminium. <laughs> so, well, you know what they say, right? If the shoe fits. <laughs> All right. So let's move on. So my journey, what I've learned basically after studying many of the events um, from the creation of the Federal Reserve to the real reasons that uh, countries go to war to 9-11 to the fake Apollo missions to chemtrails, okay? And a thousand other so-called conspiracy theories uh, is that these events are much closer to being conspiracy fact than conspiracy theory any day of the week. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So... So furthermore, it becomes obvious that for many of these grand illusions uh, to be successfully perpetrated, a collaboration at the very highest levels of government needs to be taking place. Okay, so who incorporates these? You know, who actually puts these into uh, into action? Well, these are the true agendas of the intelligence agencies, uh, like the CIA, MI6, KGB, uh, Mossad, etc. These are the agencies that are tasked with um, you know, to carry out the plans of the elite. And they do it quite well because they've got, you know, 90, 95 percent of the world in absolute belief about this and a complete stupor. So most of the lower government agencies um, are not in on the deception because of a wonderful little practice called compartmentalization. And, uh, you know, they're, they're completely unaware of it. So a lot of people can be working for the very agencies that we're kind of battling against, like NASA and uh, the other space agencies, et cetera. And they have no idea. Uh, they're, they're not in on the conspiracy. They have no idea what's going on. And, yeah, you know, something, something that we don't say enough, but we don't think all scientists are lying. We don't think that all of NASA's employees are lying. It really comes down to very few in the way that they compartmentalize everything allows them to get away with these things without anybody noticing. So there's no teachers that are out there lying to children, like I said yesterday. Um, you know, teachers want to help teach the truth. And it just so happens that they don't know that they were taught a lie and that they're teaching a lie. And so we hope to uh, you know, change that. Absolutely. So I've never understood the mentality um, you know, behind the way that the world operates today. Um, from my entire life, I've kind of felt separate and I've always felt like nothing was quite right. So today, at least I know I am not alone in that thought. <laughs> there is definitely something wrong with this world. Absolutely. And I think most of us are aware of that. So so when, one wake, when, when we actually awaken to these realities um, and we start to understand that the real reasons that the world is the way that it is, it's kind of a cold, hard slap in the face, right? But 
At the same time, it kind of brings a wondrous realization. And that realization, that realization is, you know, about our true nature, you know, that we're actually very special. And we start to realize that there is a purpose to our life. And um, we are beginning to understand more about ourselves and about this place that we inhabit. Okay. So it's kind of like, it's kind of like the first day of school, you know, all over again. But this time, we are quite engaged, aren't we? <laughs> no doubt. All right. So back to the flat earth thing. Um, growing up, I, I was and I still am a huge Star Trek and Star Wars fan. And... Uh, Oops, we get the wrong slide there. Okay, all right. <laughs> I'm trying to go on with the, the, the slides here. But anyway, so if it was about space, I was all over it. And, you know, like most people, uh, I would dream about traveling the universe. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's me, Lieutenant Commander Nodell there. <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I was all about Star Trek. This particular picture was taken at the uh, Hilton Star Trek uh, exhibit in Las Vegas. And uh, I couldn't wait to get there and, you know, take a little tour of the Starship Enterprise. It was a lot of fun. So anyway, so I absolutely have loved considering the possibilities of an endless universe. You know, I would think, you know, gosh, there's so much out there in space. If space ender ever ended, you know, what's beyond that? I don't know. But I was always thinking about that. And now I have some different things to think about now that I kind of look at the earth as a flat earth. So um, I spent a lot of time pouring through a lot of NASA images, um, looking for smoking gun proof of aliens or UFOs. And after a while, you know, while researching NASA, I became quite aware that all of the published images that are out there are clearly fabricated. And that's kind of how I came into flat earth was researching, you know, looking at NASA. Um, I had no idea that the answer to all the questions I was seeking was would lead me to this place. But yet when I got here um, and realized that everything I saw was a Hollywood production, it was a pretty short leap to understand that, well, maybe the reason that NASA is hiding everything and doing all the fake underwater photos and all this stuff is maybe because they're hiding uh, the fact that the earth is not what they have told us so and i think, I think a lot of people i think that's something a lot of people can identify with too that we all didn't come into this um we all happened to it fall in our, fell in our lap or was researching something else and all of a sudden it was in your recommended or for me i was looking at the moon landings and when you find it i don't know about you guys but everything else made sense for the first time ever uh you all the other conspiracies were explained. And it's just something that uh, when it feels right, it's got to be for a reason, right? Absolutely. So I searched and I contemplated for nearly a year while I was looking at NASA, uh, trying to reconcile why they would be faking everything, right? So after I came across the flat earth topic, it was just like, wow, th this is it no doubt about it. And at that point, I started putting together a case, you know, to try and explain to other people. And this case led to what I have often referred to in Globusters <laughs> as the preponderance of evidence. <laughs> okay. So what is a preponderance of evidence? So a preponderance of evidence is essentially a body of evidences that support a specific claim or claims. All right. It is typically comprised of exhibits and testimonies that lend credence and viability to those claims. Uh, and in the case of the flat earth, um, there is not only a wealth of evidence to support the claim uh, that the earth is a level plane, but there's also a wealth of evidence to support the idea that, that challenged the current heliocentric belief. So uh, a lot of people will say, no, you don't ever have any evidence. There's not one bit of it. And that is absolutely not the truth. In fact, the, the, the evidence is voluminous uh, both ways. So, okay. <laughs> so just exactly what are some of these exhibits and testimonies? 
All right. Well, glad you asked because we're going to cover that today. <laughs> <laughs> so the first thing we'll start with is some astronomical relationships. And again, like I said at the beginning, a lot of these uh, are born uh, trying to appeal to people's common sense. Okay. So the first thing I want you to think about is consider the sun. Okay. And they tell us that the sun is 865,000 miles in diameter. I mean, this is absolutely unimaginable. We have no reference to that here on Earth. We have, no, we have nothing to compare that to. But even worse than that, they tell us that the sun is a whopping 93 million miles away from us. Okay, great. So they're building their model. So consider, this, consider the fact that light travels at a speed of 671 million miles per hour. So if you do the math, that tells us that the sun is about eight light minutes away from here. So traveling at the speed of light, it takes the sunlight uh, about eight minutes to get here. Okay, great. So, and at that distance, an amazing thing has happened. It has gone from this unimaginable whopping 865,000 miles across down to the size of a Frisbee in our sky. It's tiny, right? So you have to wonder if it, if it gets that small in just that, that mere small distance of eight light minutes, what does it look like possibly from other planets? Okay. So if we look at it and we look at it from say Saturn. Okay. So we see that even at Saturn, the sun is greatly reduced. And of course, these are artist conceptions because we know nobody's ever actually been to Saturn to photograph it, right? <laughs> uh, then we go on to Uranus. It gets even a little bit smaller. It's, it's beginning to look like a bright star in the sky just at, uh, at Uranus, but certainly nothing like what we experience here on Earth. And then we go to Pluto, right? And the interesting thing about Pluto, uh, other than the fact that it has Pluto on, uh, on the surface of it, <laughs> is that Pluto is 30 times further away um, from the sun than the Earth is, okay? And when you get that far away, they tell us that the sun's light at Pluto is 1,000 times dimmer than it is here on Earth. Okay, so that's what, maybe the moon, maybe less, not very bright, okay? And all of this is taking place in less than one light hour, okay? Which is an incredibly short distance. So now I want you to consider something else that we've all seen in the sky. We've all looked up and we've all seen Polaris and it's also known as our North Star, okay? So Polaris as a star is 46 times bigger than our sun, so they tell us, okay? But at a distance of 433.8 light years from us, that puts it at a distance of 27,436,619 times further away than the sun. <laughs> Do you ever wonder how we can possibly see its light? Does that make any sense at all? <laughs> 27 and a half million times. I mean, that is ridiculous. Really yeah, we'll see it. Can, can you go find a ticket on that? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, and, and it's funny because when I was putting this together, I had to do the math four or five times. And I'm like, this can't be right. And then I, I told Bob, I said, your math is wrong here. Let me do it. <laughs> so Jaron did it four times. Oh, I guess it is right. So you, you must be tw 27,000 times. But no, it's 20, 27 million, million times. It's unbelievable. So that's obviously a really good argument that, that, that I like to spring on people. And that's what you could say to them, too. You know, consider that. You know, we, we're dealing with eight light minutes to an hour at most for our solar system as compared to something that's 438 light years away. It's just, it's ridiculous that, that they ever ask us to believe that. So another one of the common sense things that we can kind of take to our friends and argue about is um, when you look at the moon, there's a crater on the moon that's called Aristarchus. Okay, and Aristarchus is circled here on the map. And Aristarchus is a minuscule 25 miles in diameter. Now, 25 miles would be pretty big object here on Earth, but when you start backing that off to a distance of order, over a quarter of a million miles, 
again, how is it possible that the human eye, uh, with its minimal uh, angular resolution, how is it possible that we could ever see that? Well, I think the answer is pretty obvious, right? It's not a quarter of a million miles away. So another good one. These are really good proofs, like I said. So another one to think about. Um, they tell us that the ISS um, is about the same size as a 747. And it's also about the same size as a football field, around 100, 100 yards, 100 meters, something like that. And we've all seen planes fly over, and we've seen them fly at cruising altitude. And typically, that cruising altitude runs about uh, 30, somewhere between 30 and 40,000 feet. And that puts it up at about six miles. So when we're looking up at these aircraft, and they're flying uh, at a mere distance of six miles up, we are pretty much at the limit of our eye's angular resolution, all right? In other words, we can't see an object that size much further than that. Yet, we have the ISS, which is at 254 miles up, 42 times further away. <laughs> now, again, apply some common sense here. How is this possible that we can see it at all, let alone as this brilliantly bright object going across the sky? Well, NASA's answer to that would be definitely... Um, well, it's because the sun, when it's below the horizon, it's shining off the bottom of it and reflecting it. Of course, the ISS is not exactly a reflective object. And if you've ever watched the ISS live feed, you know that uh, it just doesn't light up like that. So again, another big disconnect. So, so there's a NASA app, and it is called Spot the Station. A lot of you may be familiar with it. Anybody, does anybody use it? Show of hands that, that uses uh, the Spot the Station app? Okay, well, a few of you. Well, if not, you can Google it. And what Spot the Station does is it will notify you whenever the ISS is going to fly over your town, all right? And it, it's kind of cool because it tells you exactly when it's going to be there, uh, where it's going to rise, um, what part of the sky, and it tells you how long it's going to be visible before it disappears over the horizon. Okay. And, and it's free. And it's free. Yeah, good part, right? So yeah, I yeah, did this. <laughs> free indoctrination, she said. Right, right. They're not going to charge you for that. Just like school. I always wondered, why is school free? Oh, now I get it. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> so anyway, many of these, uh, these apps are free, and that's great. So whenever it would fly over, and, and any of you that follow Globusters will know that we did a special, we did a Tuesday night show, I believe, on, on the ISS for um, well over a year, mm -hmm. where all we did was sit there and watch the ISS, and we ran across some doozies. I mean, <laughs> oh man, NASA was bad. So, but after a year, we gave that up, and uh, I started, after I got my P900, I'm like, okay, I'm going to go out there, and I'm going to see if I can take a picture of it. So I would go outside early in the morning because it usually will appear just before sunrise or just after sunset. And I would get up and go out in the morning or in the evening. And in Denver, we have over 300 days a year that are absolute sunshine, beautiful weather there. And so I would go outside and I'd look up and sure enough, I'd see the ISS coming over the horizon. Well, when I went outside, I would bring up both live feeds. Now the ISS, you may not know this, the ISS has two live feeds on Ustream. Uh, one is an HD feed and one is a standard resolution feed, okay? So I would bring up both of those feeds and I'd go outside and I'd see, you know, the clear sky all around. And here comes the ISS, you know, kind of lumbering along. And then I would look at the live feed. And then I look at the sky. And I look at the live feed. And it's like, wait a minute. The live feed is showing not only Denver is completely overcast, but the entire country and most of the world, right? <laughs> so... <laughs> And, and this is something that happened time after time after time. Again, Jaren's done it. We've asked our viewers to do it. And this is something that you can do, right? If you want, you know, we all get the, we all get the argument from people. Oh, well, you can see the ISS flying overhead. It's got to be there, right? Well, there's something there, but I don't think it's the ISS. And it's something that you guys can do yourself since it's all free. And there's even, uh, I think it's called... Uh, screen capture i can't think of the name of the site right now but there's a free screen capture site um screen screen capture matic something like that um but you can yeah, screen cast -o -matic. Yeah, yeah screen cast -o -matic. Yeah. you can bring that up bring up the live feeds and start recording that and then go out in front 
and film the ISS as it goes over your head. And then go back in and look at the uh, recording and you'll see what I saw. I have a couple of different videos on my channel that show we had a completely clear sky and we watched the ISS go over and we ran inside and sure enough, the entire sky was covered with clouds. So when these people tell you that it's proof or the ISS is proof, you know, ask them to do the same thing. Ask them to get video footage from the ground um, showing it. Because most times, isn't it convenient that uh, the ISS, when it flies by during the day, it can see the ground. But during the day from the ground, you can't see it. But at night, um, you can see the ISS going over. But from their view, you can't see the ground. They just show black. So awfully convenient and an easy way to, to fool you rather than what I think would be proof is if you had a 24 hour camera on the ISS and just to think about that is enough to drive anybody crazy. How can we not have a 24 hour camera of the earth or a 24 camera view of where we live? You know, it's our money that NASA exists off of and I always get upset that the first thing they should do is take care of those who are funding them. And then if they wanna go play and la la land out in Saturn or something like that, that's fine. But they don't even start by satisfying us with a picture of our home. 24 hour view, they say, oh, it's going on the dark side. You've seen me make fun of the blue screen. It comes up because they say it's on the dark side of the earth, yet they supposedly have satellites. It doesn't make any sense. You can't have both. If you have a satellite, then bounce the beam off and back down to Houston, but they can't do it. So needless to say, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. And you know, we do say that a lot, and that's because these things do not make sense. And they are non sequitur, they don't follow. Uh, they don't follow common sense, they don't call, uh, follow logic, but because of the fact that NASA says so and science says so, we're kind of forced to take it, take them at their word, but uh, we're not going to do that. We're not going to do that. So now I want you to think about, picture in your head the following, okay? So they tell us the ISS is traveling at a speed of about 17,500 miles an hour, give or take, okay? Now the speed of a bullet <laughs> is uh, it's about uh, half mile per second, right? About 2,500 miles per, or 2,500 foot per second, excuse me. Uh, so about a half mile per second, and if you work out the math, it works out to be about 1,700 miles per hour, plus or minus, okay? So what does that tell us? That tells us that the ISS, at the size of a football field, is traveling over 10 times the speed of a bullet, right? Is that reasonable? No, I, I don't think so. Of course, NASA will say, well, there's no atmosphere up there. Nothing's going to tear it apart. So, of course, we can go those speeds. Absolutely. So, okay, we'll accept that. So, we have something to compare it to, though. And this is one thing that I think a lot of people don't really think about. Um, I want you to think about if you've ever seen meteor showers, like the Perseids or the Leonids. You go outside and they come around, you know, on a yearly basis and they're they're always there and they're quite beautiful and they're quite spectacular and they're quite noisy if you get in a spot where you can listen to them. They have a very crackly electrical sound. But the thing that I want to highlight about them is when we look up some information on meteor showers, uh, we find that they streak across the sky at anywhere from a speed of 25,000 miles per hour to, and that's for the, the, the much smaller ones, or the much bigger ones, excuse me, 25,000 miles an hour. Um, and that would be up to uh, 100 yards or 300 feet. After 300 feet, NASA reclassifies uh, meteors as asteroids, and we certainly don't want to see those, right? So 25,000 miles an hour for the, for the large ones, and the micrometeorites uh, travel at a speed of about 160,000 miles per hour. Okay, so if we kind of average that out and say that, uh, you know, your, your average meteorite is going to be traveling at somewhere in the speed of um, oh, maybe to 70 to 90,000 miles an hour. Okay, we're talking about a factor of, you know, at minimum two to uh, maximum eight times slower, and that's kind of taking it to the extremes, but more on the average of about five times difference in speed. So when we see these meteorites go across the sky, I mean, they literally just go whoosh, and they, they cover a great swath of the sky instantaneously within a fraction of a second. And they're only doing maybe three to four times the speed of the ISS. So when we, when we go outside and we watch the ISS and you see it come over um, and it's doing its 17,500 miles per hour, it just kind of lumbers across the sky 
and it takes anywhere from four minutes to about eight minutes to completely traverse the sky. Now there's another really big disconnect there, right? In comparison to meteorites, um, it just doesn't add up. And this is, you know, this is another one of those great big disconnects. You know, it doesn't it doesn't follow non sequitur, as I like to say. Yeah, and seventeen thousand five hundred miles per hour. That's uh, about ninety football fields in a second. So when you picture yourself being at a football game or looking at a football field, to think ninety in one second is ridiculous. Yeah. It is. It's absurd. You know, I mean, we, we have a hard time even imagining the speed of a bullet, you know, let alone something going 10 times that, that size. It's a little crazy. So, and, and granted, I will, you know, I will make the concession that, yes, the, the meteors are coming in and burning up at, in our atmosphere at about one third the altitude of the ISS. But still, even if you compensate for that, shouldn't really shouldn't we really be seeing the ISS traverse the sky all the way across the sky uh, in a time of about seven to twenty-one seconds rather than eight minutes? And that's another thing to see the, the these meteoroids coming in. They have to look down from the ISS, meaning they could be hit at any time by them, and yet it never happens. They're just happy to say that they can look down at the atmosphere and watch them light up. It's crazy. Yeah. Absolutely. And if you've ever watched the Perseids or the Leonids or anything like that, you know that they come in at a fantastic rate. And these are just the ones that they tell us about that are so spectacularly visible, right? They tell us that we get hit by absolutely millions and millions and millions of meteors every single year. In other words, we're constantly being bombarded with it. Okay, so think about this. If that's actually happening, and these, these meteors are coming in at a speed from 25,000 to 160,000 miles an hour, all of them are coming through where all of the geostationary satellites are at roughly about 25,000 miles up, all the way down to where the low Earth orbit vehicles are, like the ISS. And if anything going at that speed would hit any spacecraft or the ISS or God forbid any astronaut out on a spacewalk, they would be annihilated. They would absolutely explode at that velocity. Nothing could withstand that. Um, I don't care how much Kevlar or anything that they make these out of, nothing is going to withstand these little bits of iron that are flying into the atmosphere at that speed. So that's just another thing that you've got to consider. Why is it that we never see these catastrophic collisions that are hitting our communication satellites or all the other whatever the figure is you know i've heard a figure of anywhere from four to forty thousand satellites in space i don't know what it is because it changes from every site that you go to mm -hmm. but yet the iss is never damaged well i take that back one time i think uh this is so funny they uh made a big deal they said well a meteor strike actually struck the iss and this was about five years ago i think something like that and uh, it was funny because i was a big reader of this uh, website called clues forum and Clues Forum did a picture expose on it. And it was so funny because all the space agencies that were involved in it, like the ESA, uh, NASA, uh, JAXA, whoever, they all had different pictures of the damage that was supposedly done to the ISS. But what was funny is not only was the damage different, but the entire solar arrays <laughs> on the ISS were completely portrayed differently and they were submitted. So the space agencies couldn't even get their act straight on that. It's absolutely amazing. So again, these are common sense things. Why don't they ever get hit? Why doesn't this happen? You know, why aren't we constantly losing um, communications? You know, why don't we lose our direct TV, our dish network? It just, it just does never happen. So that's another thing. So let's uh, talk about some of the problems in the heliocentric model and kind of move on from that. So one of the biggest problems I think in the heliocentric models, first of all, is the seasons, okay? The heliocentric model, as well as the polar climates, appear to be completely non sequitur. There's that word again, uh, with the explanations that are given for them. Okay, for example, in the heliocentric model, the sun is three million three million miles further away, or that equates to 379 Earth diameters further away in the summertime, the northern summertime, than it is in the winter. Well, NASA tries to explain that away by the, the tilt and all that stuff. But again, these explanations really don't wash. Because when you look 
at the climates and, and the ecosystems in the extreme north latitudes, where it's like 60 degrees north, where, the, you know, where we have Norway, we see that Norway has got a beautiful, you know, lush uh, ecosphere. It, it gets cold there, yes, but it actually uh, gets to be nice days, uh, lots of vegetations, there's lots of indigenous wildlife, um, all kind of, I mean, night and day. And then you go and you look at the South Pole, McMurdo. Well, you go down there and basically the only indigenous life form is the emperor penguin. And it's essentially a desolate waste. And these, this is the way it goes from 60 south all the way to 90 south, allegedly, right? Complete disconnect once again from its opposite complementary latitudes. So, and then when you look at the latitudes between the equator to 60 south and the equator to 60 north, every complementary latitude is virtually identical in climate. So that drives, but as soon as you get to the polar regions, there's an absolute and total disconnect that makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. And this one's completely opposite. I mean, so, so wrong, it's not even funny, to have the cold end be where the sun is closest, by, like Bob said, 370, 379, 379 yeah. Earth diameters closer. Um, I mean, anybody can go outside during the summer and you know that the sun is closer to you in the summer. You can feel it, it's right on your face go out at noon on a summer day and look up at the sun and then go out at noon on a winter day and look up at the sun, you won't even feel it. And then to try and believe that it's 3 million miles closer to you simply isn't the case. Yep, absolutely true. So another thing for you to put in your arsenal when you're talking to your globy friends, all right? <laughs> <laughs> so eclipses, well, eclipses, this is something that's amazing. We recently went out to uh, Alliance, Nebraska and witnessed the eclipse. And if you've never seen anything like that in totality, it is absolutely one of the most beautiful sights you will ever see in your life. Um, interestingly enough though, we never saw the moon come in. Uh, we just saw this black dark object. We never saw any hint whatsoever of the moon. A lot of people argue that it is there, but you know, we couldn't see it, let's put it that way. But beyond that, there is a body of evidence, a rather large body of evidence that indicates and tells us that um, the eclipses as portrayed in the heliocentric model really don't work. Um, and we have studied this uh, ad nauseum and there's a group of researchers that's very dedicated to this. And in fact, they have gone so far as to put their money where their mouth is and they issued on Facebook what's called the $5,000 NASA Eclipse Challenge. Now, this wasn't just something that they posted on a Facebook page, hoping that people would, would be able to see it and you know, take up the challenge. Uh, what, uh, what this guy actually did is he emailed, or excuse me, he actually physically mailed, you know, uh, snail mail, uh, hundreds of universities all over this country and all over the world to their uh, astronomics departments, um, astrophysics, et cetera, issuing this challenge and saying, look, if you can match this data up with the heliocentric model, you got yourself $5,000, right? You would think that somebody would take that offer up, but to this day, nobody has ever taken that offer up. Um, and if and when they do, um, I'm sure it'll be big news. But, uh, and this challenge has been out there for what, well, two years? Yeah. Something like that. It's absolutely out there. So we're willing to put our money where, the mouth, where our mouth is and uh, actually issue some of these challenges, but it's amazing, it's, it's just crickets. So we've all seen a lot of the NASA stuff, and actually I was gonna cover a whole bunch of, of NASA stuff, but when Rob Skiba came out here yesterday, and even Nehru, uh, with a lot of his stuff, they really kind of covered a lot of stuff that I was gonna cover, and I, I don't wanna duplicate it. So that saved us a little bit of time, but... Uh, you know, um, if you just allow me, Sure. Can, can you back to that slide? Because um, a lot of scientists talk about that the, um, the only shape that can produce a round shadow on the surface of the moon is a spherical shape, you know? So first of all, a cylindrical shape is also uh, can produce that round shadow. But this footage was sent me by a friend from Italy. It just, you know, like a joke uh, footage. Uh, can you pull it play? You're gonna see that um, he compared with the shadow of the eclipse of the moon, of course. He haven't, uh, uh, he's not with, and just for fun, he's gonna take a rectangle shape. Um, 
So you're going to start to see how the shadow project on the spherical object. And uh, you're going to see that uh, if the uh, object is a sphere uh, or hemisphere, uh, you're going to reproduce the same kind of shadow. So <laughs> maybe the earth is a square, you know? <laughs> Right. So how many times so, have we heard this argument? Right? Sorry, Bill Nye. Oh, yeah. It's like Neil deGrasse Tyson says, oh, look, it's... <laughs> yeah. Yep, that's great. Oh, look, the only thing is this proves that it's the Earth eclipsing because the only thing that could possibly cast a shadow like that and is remember, a spherical object. Yeah, remember that any light you see on the sky is projected in the last layer of the atmosphere called the Kalman line. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. maybe the moon is spherical, maybe the moon is hemispherical. Uh, we don't really know, but uh, when you see from, from the ground and you look up, you're gonna see all that light compressed in the layer of the atmosphere. So that is why it's very difficult to imagine if uh, the volume of the, that sphere. Mm -hmm. So maybe the moon is spherical, we don't know. Absolutely. So that's another good one, right? Keep that one in mind. <laughs> all right. So we've all seen these these pictures, the famous blue marble, um, the fact that that they're they're created in Photoshop, but but it has to be, right? <laughs> we see the cloud stamping. We see them put the word "sex" in the clouds. Um, it's just ridiculous. It, on one picture, they have the United States that that literally takes up half the globe. It's absolutely ridiculous, the inconsistencies that they come up with. And these are very easy proofs. And these are supposed to be legitimate images. But remember, as Zero pointed out yesterday, the word images comes from imagination. Okay? So that's exactly what they're doing is they, they imagine these great, they've dreamt this up, and, you know, that's about it. So, Ir, did you, did you have, did we have some other things that we wanted to roll on, on the NASA? Yeah, I, have that? Um, I'm just hidden. I bring again some of the footage that uh, yesterday I can maybe complete uh, show you if you can. Uh, or was that uh, was that the video? I'm not sure. Yeah, there is a, a couple of video. The first one is, of course, that the, um, this uh, this has a little audio uh, talking about how the Earth was made. So if you can play. The shot is compiled from data from NASA's VIRS instrument, which orbits the Earth about every 100 minutes, taking measurements of light coming off the planet. That can be translated into ribbons of imagery like this. There's a small problem with it because there's a very slight gap in between each orbit. So some of those are painted on. It is Photoshop, but it's, it's has to be. It is Photoshop, but it's, it's <laughs> so, has to be. It is Photoshop, um, but it's, it's. Well, you notice it, that these, uh, these guys made all about CGI. For example, this is a software that ESA uses to uh, all that picture taken from the ground and they compose it on the Photoshop. They had their own apps uh, running inside Photoshop and so that uh, is how they mix the lights and present that like, like a real galaxy taken from the Hubble. So it's all made on computer. They are already done that. Uh, that was the supposedly, you know, telescope up in the space, but then you realize that that all that kind of image I'm taking from a plane called Sophia, I think uh, everybody knows uh, already. But that is how they fake uh, planets, uh, they fake galaxies. They are not just faking everything because the, the the main picture or the main image is taken real, but it's from the ground. It's not outside telescope in the space floating there, and that telescope have the you know the only capabilities to take that photo because it's. Uh, we know any kind of atmosphere layer distortion or, or blocking uh, the view. It's taken from a plane. They go. If you go just uh, 10 kilometers, 50 kilometers up there, you're gonna have a see really clear sky, and uh, you're gonna take a, a lot of picture in infrared and that kind of uh, technology. So that is why they're faking. If you can next slide. Um, for example, well, I I, I show you. Um, yesterday, a little bit of this. Uh, anyone uh, our days uh, can put in Google um, uh, Earth uh, map texture, and you're gonna find uh, all the texture you need about the cloud te uh, layer, the ground layer, the city lights layer. Uh, it's already done uh, there, and 
you can download from free. Uh, of course, we, we have a, a lot of uh, quality image. This is me playing, uh, you know, with a little uh, 3D models, <laughs> putting in After Effects, um, changing the, the shadows. And when you see that kind of image, you must be understand that they can film from drones, from balloons, from plane. They just pass over filming the real surface and then mapping on the sphere, they composite, and then you have the ESS live show. Uh, that is how it's, it's very easy on those days. And the next one, please. And uh, for example, um, like I showed yesterday, uh, they have been uh, doing this from a lot of years. And uh, the masters, you know, uh, with the years, you really become a master. So that is why it's so shitty image there are those earths. And of course, they have the most technology painting balls ever made, which is <laughs> this one. <laughs> so <laughs> they doing only in the, this is a picture from the eighties because in the, in the eighties, the CGI technology, uh, you know, the, the, it was better painting than the doing a computer. So uh, to, uh, right now they are in, start making a computer. Uh, but y if you, you know, if you take the, the, the line, the, the time, the line time, um, you can see how they get better and better and better until it goes uh, in the base. Okay. And, uh, of course, uh, you have all the patent there. If you can go slide, um, next slide, next slide, uh, because it's just for uh, showing that you have all this uh, for your own if you want to research. Can you next? And I've had people ask me about or tell me they have an explanation for that track and the moon ball, the half, the half uh, hemisphere there. And their explanation is that, oh, they use that for practice. So I've asked them, well, where's that footage? Let me see the footage of these practice rounds they did with this camera on a track that's out in front. And of course they can't supply that because it would look exactly like the moon landing footage, which is what they actually used it for. They would have both. They would have an example of, well, this is our practice and this is when we actually landed. But there is only one set of footages and that's the one that they use to tell people that we actually landed there. So obviously that was used to fake the landing. Yeah. Is that it? Is that that's your part? Okay. <laughs> All right. Beautiful. <laughs> we kind of hurriedly put this together yesterday because um, uh, Iru was uh, kind of a last minute addition. He did such a fantastic job yesterday that uh, we really wanted to make it possible for him to to present the rest of his material. So. Um, Excuse those little transgressions there. Okay, mm -hmm. so next up, ISS and radiant heat. Okay, so the ISS orders uh, orbits in what they call the thermosphere. Okay, and the thermosphere is a region of the atmosphere um, that gets as hot as 4,500 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, at that temperature, there are very few metals or very few substances on Earth that will withstand that kind of heat without turning into, you know, molten just whatever. <laughs> um, so NASA says, well, the reason that the ISS just doesn't, you know, completely melt up there, uh, and this is kind of a misdirection, by the way, they say, well, at that level, the air molecules are so sparse that any type of convective heat um, to the ISS would be non-existent because the, these little, you know, so few air molecules are never going to um, pass that heat on. Well, that's all fine and dandy, except that's not the issue. The issue um, is not a matter of, of how the ISS is affected by convective heat, but it is how it is affected by radiant heat. And this is the type of heat that is hitting it directly, right? Okay. And not only would the radiant heat from the sun, supposedly, like I said, if they knew this was real, which we don't believe it is, uh, not only would it absolutely fry anybody inside, it would melt the ISS. There is no way they could possibly, um, you know, convect this heat away from the ISS. It would just, they just simply can't do it. So, but in addition to that, you know, what, so you have to go back to thinking, what exactly is it that's heating up those sparse air molecules to 4,500 degrees? You know, again, it's that radiant heat. And along with that radiant heat comes gamma rays and x-rays which are very lethal to human tissue not much can withstand that and honestly it it would probably take a couple feet of 
of lead to be able to shield anybody from that type of radiation. I mean, think about it. When you go to a dentist's office, they put a lead apron on you just for shooting a little dental x-ray. Um, these, these gamma and x-ray radiations are orders of magnitude higher, and it, nobody could really survive it. And, and NASA just conveniently really doesn't address that. Um, but they do talk a lot about how the Orion project is going to be trying out all this new shielding, right? So they obviously are acknowledging it. But anyway, so when you're dealing with radiant heat, um, and you, again, you are looking at, at what the ISS is made of, um, the carbon, titanium, aluminum, composites, stuff like that, uh, really what it, what it is ideal for is to create an oven, right? So that's exactly what's going on. The, the crew would be cooked. It's simply not possible to do this. They have no reasonable explanation for how the ISS can be flying around up there, let alone anybody surviving on it. And then there's questions about the electronics. It just goes on and on and on and on, but we'll kind of leave it at that. So we'll move on. And one other thing I want to point out, and many of you have seen this photograph, these, this is the crew of the Challenger, and we also uh, we all saw STS-51, you know, go up in flames. And it, it it looks, it appears today that that most of these, if not all of these astronauts, and likely all of them, because if one survived, they all did, um, are likely alive. Um, the only picture that we kind of disagree with on here, and and Jaren brought this up to me yesterday, is Judith Resnick, because you know, she's the one in the lower right hand corner, and she's the Yale law professor. But we found some earlier footage, or Jaren did, found some earlier footage of her, and uh, the earlier footage of her looks much more like her older self than the Judith Resnick that went up on the ISS. So that's possibly not accurate. And, you know, we just kind of want to acknowledge that. But the rest of them, um, Dick Scobie, which to me sounds like kind of a venereal disease, um, <laughs> it is absolutely... <laughs> <laughs> it's absolutely the same guy. And um, as far as the other ones, uh, two of them allegedly had perfect twin brothers. Of course, again, when researching birth records, there is no birth record of twins with these astronauts. So again, it's another fish story with NASA. Okay. So, all right. So then, you know, we move on and a lot of us have looked at the Apollo missions, right? And I'm not going to say a whole lot about this because you know, Rob did a great job. You know, allus.com is a fabulous website for researching this. But um, as one of the people in the community uh, defines this, this looks more like a homeless tweaker shelter <laughs> <laughs> than a lunar lander. And when you look at it and you scrutinize it, the construction of it is absolutely ridiculous. It looks like it was put together with scotch tape, aluminum foil, a little bit of construction paper, uh, maybe some gray paint. And also notice that there's no glass crater or anything like that below it. I mean, absolutely fabricated, set on the stage. And for anybody to believe that this thing withstood the velocities and the heat and the radiation and all the stuff that it was supposed to do, uh, and they did this back in 1969, no way, Jose. And then it took <laughs> off and reconnected with the command module in free space. You know, no, no coordinate system to, to, to reference. There's no way. It's just, it's impossible. And you forgot to mention they used curtain rods. Oh, yeah, yeah. Forgot about the curtain rods. I see a few of those. So, all right. <laughs> so enough partial on Apollo. They're, they're too easy. That's just yeah. too easy of a target. <laughs> okay, so next up, we're going to talk about some of this guy's work right here. All right. If you don't know who this is, um, this is Nikola Tesla. And many people have never heard of Nikola Tesla, but I would say that Nikola is probably arguably one of the most brilliant men to ever walk the face of the earth. Conveniently left out of science class. Can you imagine that? Yeah, yeah, never absolutely. Me, never mentioned his name. Nope, no formal education. So anyway, where I got this, I gotta tell you, this, I got this statue from Iru. Iru brought this to me from Argentina. Uh, a good friend of his made it, um, and they made it specifically for my birthday. My birthday was November 6th. I just turned 57, and he wanted to... <laughs> <laughs> so, Ira wanted to bring something that would be very memorable, and when he brought me this, I was just blown away, because I love Nikola Tesla, and I will absolutely cherish this. Thank you so much for it, Nikola. So... <laughs> So 
So in the spirit of Nikola Tesla's work, um, we both, both Ira and I are big, big fans and proponents of what's called the electric universe model. Um, and the electric universe model uh, is primarily, it's called the Thunderbolts project, if you want to look it up on the web or on YouTube. And it is made up um, of a large group of scientists and engineers, uh, a very large group, and it's growing exponentially. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. They also have the EU conference every single year, and it's a conference that's probably rivaling the size of this one. Um, and it's very, very much catching on uh, with all the physicists and engineers. So all of these scientists, engineers, um, pretty much all believe that the gravitationally ruled cosmology of our universe is nonsense, right? They're not on board with Einstein, not a bit. They see the universe as an electrical phenomenon. And being an electrical engineer myself, that is exactly how I view the universe as well. Uh, it makes perfect sense, every part of it. Um, it's, and the evidence is absolutely overwhelming, but we'll, we'll cover that a little bit. So they realize that you know gravity is nonsense, and of course, they are up and coming. They're very much emerging. So recently, after only a mere 4 billion year wait, gravity waves, as you may know, <laughs> have finally been discovered, right? Um, and it isn't as if we weren't already swimming in multiple gravitational for waves, right? The moon, the sun, all these other gravitational influences that we could have. No, it, it took an event that happened a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away to bring us the detection of gravity waves from LIGO, all right? Billions of years ago, in, like I said, in a galaxy far, far away. And they needed to do this to prove Einstein and his gravitational theories correct, because basically they are really taking a beating. Uh, in fact, general relativity in general <laughs> is taking a beating. It just doesn't make sense, and a lot of physicists today know it. So it's not just us crazy flat earthers that, that know this. Um, it, it's a growing no number of scientists and engineers. So the... And it the, just so happens that they did that on the 100th anniversary. It was 100, yeah. 100 years to the year that Einstein had predicted gravitational waves that, surprise, they found. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So the electric universe model is demonstrating reproducible phenomena in the lab that mimics and explains the phenomena astronomer, astronomers are seeing in what they believe to be deep space, okay? We as flat earthers support this work because not only do we believe that they are probably onto something, but when scaled back and modeled inside of a closed system Earth, as we believe it is, it works perfectly for the emerging electromagnetic electrostatic flat Earth model. Okay, and more information can be found on this by searching, like I said, the Thunderbolts project. So some of the highlights of the EU model um, is that it defines gravity as electrostatic force. And this is something that I've done on Globebusters and demonstrated this, works very well. Uh, the Earth has a naturally occurring electrostatic field that runs on the average of 100 volts per meter going up. Um, this, is, this is absolute mainstream science too, by the way, that I'm, that I'm quoting. Uh, it extends to at least 50 kilometers, and this means that the static potential between Earth ground and 50 kilometers up is 5 million volts. And so it's not hard to understand where lightning and sprites and, and things like that, electrical phenomenon in the sky come from, because it's natural. It's part of this biosphere. All right. So the other thing that, that the EU model defines... Um, is it, well, what it does is it, it predicts and it reproduces and explains virtually all observed phenomenon in the universe. Uh, it describes the universe as plasma-based, an electrical manifestation. Uh, it predicts the sun as an electrical plasma device and a counter-spatial energy converter. Uh, and a lot of you may have heard of Professor Eric Dollard, uh, amongst many other people that are absolutely on board with this and uh, have done a lot of fantastic work under college grants. So. It's a very real thing. So it is very similar to the emerging electromagnetic electrostatic flat earth model. The difference again is scale. They're scaling electrical phenomena up to uh, a universal level and we're kind of keeping it in our little terrarium here. But either way, it actually works because all electro electrical phenomena is scalable, especially when you're dealing with plasma physics. 
So physicist Walt Thornhill, the lead scientist of the Thunderbolts project, gives a terrific explanation. Okay, so I'm going to let Iru uh, do some of your slides. I think they're going to put those in, and she's going to talk yeah. about these. Uh, I showed you this uh, yesterday, but not uh, the complete one. First of all, if you see here, you have in a, a smaller scale that reproduce how the terraform uh, geological phenomena uh, can be made by electrical force. That is the symbolic of seals, you know, the thunder uh, creating the world. And you can see it's exactly the, the same shapes, the same, uh, you know, um, that kind of energy level that can uh, shape our plan, our plane. And they, they, these guys are reproduced on labs, so you have a science uh, involved there. And um, for example, here is uh, something that no, no, not much people uh, may aware, which is called globular lightings. These are electrical fields, uh, discharge of the atmosphere. They are not rocks uh, enter in the atmosphere. Look at the, the trace that this is going to form there. Uh, this is that shape. It's only made by electrical forces. So then the mainstream media show this kind of stuff and say, ah, oh, a meteorite entered in Russia. And, you know, <laughs> think uh, it doesn't have any sense at all because it's all that kind of stuff. Uh, you can explain it. Um, the next slide, please. Um, you can explain by uh, electrical universe. Uh, Bob uh, recently talked about the sprites, for example, and the word sprite means spirit. Uh, so that is why they talk about angel in the skies, uh, because they are non-physical um, guys, you know, with wings flying there. This is are the angel, the sprite, uh, uh, that kind of uh, symbolic names. Um, you can see here all these discharges. You can see here um, the shape of the angel, if you want to see it in that way. Uh, so when you start to look in all that kind of things, you, 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 you notice that the, here you can see the perfect combination uh, for anode and cathode. You can see the aurora borealis, which is one of the most uh, powerful energy in our plane. That is, uh, yeah, if you want to see the, the ether, uh, you have it there. Uh, directly. That is why uh, all the lead uses in this uh, in their model of symbolic uh, you know, knowledge. Uh, the next slide is about... I, I, I really like to enjoy this uh, short clip from uh, Don Scott because he's going to explain uh, how the, the sun's, uh, the electrical model of the sun works, but he's going to explain all the difficulties that the heliocentric sun model have. Uh, it's just two minutes, so uh, enjoy. Good afternoon. My name is Don Scott. Uh, the electric sun is a is a sort of a natural outgrowth of the electrical universe hypothesis. We know that there are magnetic fields. Uh, man, that part is not soundless. Uh, sorry, it, it's going to come the sound. This is the 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 model of uh, uh, the, this guy presented as uh, sun as a machine. Uh, not just, uh, you know, a fireball up in the space. Sun. There seems to be a new model, or at least another patch on the previous existing model. Problems that I feel, at least, are fatal, absolutely fatal, for the models that are so-called accepted these days. And I would like to then demonstrate how precisely those problems are no problem at all for the electrical sun model. The big problem, the famous problem, is the missing neutrinos. Uh, the idea of this heat transport from the core to the surface. Uh, there are some oscillations in the sun's size and brightness. And of course, oscillations in the solar wind, as somebody pointed out the other day. Uh, if, if there's a fusion reaction going on in the core, then how can this, does this reaction, does it have periodicities? That's never been, never, never been discussed when, in, by nuclear physicists. The, there is actually a temperature minimum in the chromosphere. Where in the world does that come from? If, if the heat is all generated at the core, the temperature should get lower and lower and lower the further away you get from this thing. And all of a sudden you find there's a minimum and then the temperature increases. Totally inexplicable uh, in light of the present standard so-called model or models. The, the, the sun actually oscillates in, in brightness from a few, few minutes to near an hour. So the thing is, pulsating very rapidly. There's no way in this world, in this solar system, that that could happen. 
Uh, and the third one is, to me, astounding if you haven't heard about it. That is, the, there's an expansion and contraction of the sun in the size of the sun. The thing actually bulges and fluctuates in size, like a balloon. <laughs> and the, the, the extent of that bulging is 10 kilometers. And that happens in about a period of about 160 minutes. Where did that come from? And how do you explain it from the so-called standard model? They just ignore it. So that for me is very, you know, um, there are really weak points uh, in the heliocentric model because like Don Scott says, uh, the, the sun bulge, you know, uh, at 10 kilometers. So can you imagine you can detect 10 kilometers in the, <laughs> at eight light years away in the sun, which is size is uh, huge. Uh, 10 kilometers, you even notice, you know, you, you, you're never going to notice 10 kilometers. So when you start to look in, in the electrical universe, you, you're going to start to uh, realize that uh, it makes a lot of sense uh, because all life in this uh, plane are electrical. We are electrical, you know, if you look it from the brain, in the heart, uh, the, the molecules, everything you can change by electrical uh, discharge. If you die, you're going to put electroshock because you are an electric guy. So the universe is the same. We are all electrical. So that's, that's all. Right. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> all right. So, okay, so we're kind of running short on time, and I do want to let Eric finish his presentation. So I'm going to finish up with just a few other points. Um, of course, some of the largest arguments put forth by flat earthers is that no curvature, of course, has ever been measured. It has never been observed, um, and nor is it ever used in any engineering practices, um, save a few token gestures like possibly the, uh, the Golden Gate Bridge. I think they allowed three inches for curvature in that, <laughs> right? Ridiculous. Um, from railroad planning to bridges, it's never used. Never ever compensated for, no engineer ever would. Um, they would be laughed out of business if they ever did. Lake Pontchartrain, for example, the Lake Pontchartrain Causeway at 24 miles long should have 384 feet of curvature built into it. And yet anybody that's ever been over it knows that it's flat and level all the way across. And it's, it's unobservable and it's unnoticeable to any of the senses. It's just not there. Okay, uh, I myself have been a pilot for almost 40 years, and um, I can tell you firsthand that pilots have never had to compensate for the curvature of the earth by constantly pushing the nose of the plane down to remain at a fixed altitude over the earth. Logically, you would have to do that, right? If you're flying around a ball, you're going to have to conform to the shape of the ball. Doesn't happen. Not only that, the instrumentation never picks it up at all. So. When you look at that, and we actually did a show on Globusters where we calculated the math from any fixed uh, frame of reference, um, that especially in a jet airliner, the level of descent, the rate of descent quickly calculates out to several thousand feet per minute if you actually look at what it should be to stay in confirmation with the level of the air, with the surface of the earth. Doesn't happen, never has, never will. Okay? So, all of these aircraft have gyroscopes on them. Um, the, the modern day gyroscopes are called ring laser or fiber optic gyroscopes, uh, but their predecessors were the mechanical gyroscopes. And we can tell you that the mechanical gyroscopes in all tests for curvature or motion have never processed while in a stationary, supposedly moving earth, right? No indication. The claim to fame for a gyroscopes is they stay rigid in space. Um, they are used by NASA, they're used by the Defense Department, they're used by everybody for navigation of all DOD projects, missiles, uh, ships, planes, carriers, you name it. Um, and again, they tell us that, again, there is no curvature and there is no motion to the Earth either, let alone uh, 1,038 miles an hour going around in a circle or 67,000 miles an hour around the sun or 670,000 miles an hour around the Milky Way or over 2 million miles an hour around the great attractor. We have gone millennia and our skies have never changed. Mm -hmm. The stars have never changed, okay? That should be a big hint to a lot of people. So, 
I like uh, to I like to break down the curvature even on a more practical scale when you look at uh, California to New York at 2,500 miles. That's 789 miles of curvature. So somebody can try and look all they want to find that. You're not going to find it. You have to go up the Sierra Nevadas, which are about three miles up, and then you come back down. So three miles down, and you got to go up a mile in Colorado, and then down a mile. And so where is 789 miles of curvature? It's nowhere to be found. Same thing if you're going to Hawaii. Your uh, California to Hawaii is 2,500 miles, so another 789 miles of curvature. It just can't be found. And if you take a surveyor who starts in New York and one who starts in California and have them work towards each other, they're both going to be measuring drop away from them, but they're going to get to Colorado. And are they in a crevice? No, they're at the top of Colorado. So how did they go up to get curvature when they both measured drop? It just doesn't equate. Okay, there you have it. Okay, so that's pretty much for this presentation. So what's on the horizon? I said I would, I would mention a little bit more about the um, Field Engineers Core Group that we, has just recently been formed. And we are going to be doing lots of experiments with uh, very high-end DOD specified ring laser gyros, mechanical gyroscopes, laser interferometers, uh, MEMS accelerometers. <laughs> All of these will be used to prove that there not only is there no curvature to the earth, there is no forward motion to the earth, as well as uh, the absolute existence of the ether that Einstein eliminated with his special theory of relativity. We will experimentally show that the ether is rotating around this plane at about 15 degrees per hour. And that's about the only thing that's moving because these, this is the dielectric energy that's coming from the sky, the stars in the sky above us. This was actually measured over 100 years ago by Sanyak, and uh, many experiments were done uh, back then that we are going to be redoing in the uh, Field Engineer Core Group. Uh, we'll be redoing the Sanyak's experiments, the Michelson-Morley, Michelson-Gale, Aries failure, and we will be carrying them out with our state-of-the-art 21st century computerized laser precision test equipment through the Field Engineers Core Group. And we will be bringing out new inventions uh, that they're being developed to be used as tools to model what we have learned and speculate our cosmology to be. So that ends it for my presentation. I'm going to kick it over um, to Iru. Of course, you know these few evidence that we've talked about today are just a small part of the already massive and growing preponderance of evidence. We are adding more all the time. We wish the world to consider this, and we will be coming out with it more and more. So I'm going to hand the microphone over to Hiro, or to the presentation, and if you can, you can do it from there if you want, that's fine. And uh, he's going to continue on with his presentation from yesterday. So give it up for Hiro. Uh, I'm going to try to make this quickly because I just have six minutes. And please let me five minutes more so I can complete the, this part because for me it's a, a globe killer because if the people can understand how the sun works on the on the horizon and and realize that the sun go away the, the, it's not the earth that is turning and the sun goes down uh, maybe that is uh, is going to start to have a lot of sense uh, about the flat earth so um, the next slide please. So here what I what I did uh, was uh, trying to replicate. Uh, the suns go away, you know, on the sunset. So first of all, we like to base on science things. So if you're talking about science, you need to replicate in the lab, you need to repeatable that kind of uh, experiment. Anyone uh, around the plane uh, must be, can do the same thing, you know, that is how science works. So when we start talking about atmospheric distortions, uh, that is reproducible on the lab. This image is going to reproduce the same phenomenon called Fata Morgana, uh, controlled by uh, heat, no? inducing heat on water, on vapor, on, on the atmosphere. And this is a few examples. Can you put play, please? Uh, you can see that phenomenon occurs, you know, in deserts, on the ground basis, on water is most, it's the most uh, commonly 
uh, expected that this phenomenon happened because there's a lot of uh, water evaporizing uh, uh, in that kind of surface. You can see how the image mirror itself and that is a, a confused because the people believe that this is part of the curve when they take a look in the sea or, or uh, long distances. The next slide. So, uh, play please. Here you can see that phenomena, how the curve of the air is changing. <laughs> so, <laughs> we live in a, a planet with life. Uh, so you can clearly see how the heat, the temperatures along the day is going to change your perceptions of the horizon. So uh, that is the, how they start to confuse with the curve. The next one. So I took this um, example from the San Martin Island uh, when some guy is filming the sunset. Uh, put a play, and here you can see a, a few things that they are very uh, interesting. Uh, the nice P900. You can see the sun here. Pause, please. Uh, okay. You're gonna push the button. Oh, okay, perfect. So uh, go a little forward. A little, little more. Uh, I'm gonna, um, I think it's gonna be a little messy in this way, um, we just wait. Because uh, everybody see the sun, you know, cut off in the middle, pause and there, okay. First of all, here you can see the clouds is also uh, cut off, you know, and ar about this line is when this mirage start happening. And it's always happening that way. Maybe some days you can notice because they are not very conditioned, but all the times it happened. In that way, if you look, the cloud is darker, but they have this little line. Uh, you know, the outer line is brighter. Why we see in this way is because that is happened like this. The clouds, of course, every, every, everybody knows that the cloud is like a plane. When you fly it from a plane, you're you're gonna see the light, the, the clouds in the linear fashion. So the sun is always up here, but the the lights it's bent by the by the air condition so what is happening there is we have the sun here we have the clouds and as long as you go far away that image start to bend in so that is why why you see the suns and the cloud cut off and you have that uh, outer line brighter because of course the sun is brighter from the top so that is why uh, you you can you, you see on the sunset the appearance of have the sun down illuminating from down, but it's always up top. So if we can continue, play. Look at that, this is lens flares, but this is a, like a reflection in atmosphere. You can see because the camera had the right exposure, but you can see how the atmosphere starts working as a mirror, as you know, a projection um, base object. So what I did here, I, I, re I tried to reproduce this, um, uh, this phenomena on computer. So put a pause there, please. So what I did is I created the, the, the sea level. I created like a beach. And I create uh, this cylinder is uh, like a glass air cylinder with different, uh, no, um, I apply a noise texture and dot, that noise is transferred in numbers. So I can change the index of refractions that the light is going to, uh, uh, travel through this cylinder. I create this square uh, object base. Th th these tiny points are uh, volumetric clouds. When you render this image, you're gonna get uh, clouds, you're not gonna get points, white uh, points. So uh, I put this like a light source on top and I move it in a linear fashion. If you can pull play, please. Um, this is the, you know, this is what I'm talking uh, early. This is the cloud from the ground and the same cloud from the ground you see totally straight, right? So you can see on this uh, 360 camera when go up, you can, you know, it's a flat plane. The clouds uh, don't lie. <laughs> so this is the movement of the light source going always. It's going to be in a straight line. Uh, it's never going to go down or nothing like that. If you like, I can share the project of C4D. So don't believe me, believe the, the project. Um, change the slide. So take a pause here. I'm gonna make some pauses here. 
first of all, the Fata Morgana effects, it's uh, totally measurement. You know, it's not just a coincidence. Oh, on Tuesday, it's going to be a Fata Morgana, but on Friday, it's not going to be there. No, it's happened all days, all the time. Uh, that is why the, there is this kind of web pages called tropospheric propagation forecast where you can measure. Uh, you can enter and you are going to have live feed information about how these uh, refraction properties occur around the plane. And if you notice, look at the image that they use on the home page. Is the sun, you know, cut off there with these light distortions? So they know that the sun is <laughs> go away, play, please. And um, in this, um, in this, uh, um, go back, okay, and play. It's not a video. Oh, well, that okay. Um, I think, okay, well, strange thing. Um, okay, that doesn't matter. So, um, this is a video, right? Yeah, uh, okay. okay, in this slide, is video. okay. Here, when I render, you, you can see how the sun's you know going in a straight line. So, uh, when I render the pause there, when I render, um, Pause, pause, pause. <laughs> okay, no. Oh my, okay. Go back, okay. Play. Uh, don't, don't, don't leave the, 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 the play and pause bar uh, go away because if not, you, you're gonna turn crazy trying to put pause. So <laughs> leave the mouse always on, on that button, please. So, uh, uh, pause, okay. There's a pause, okay. <laughs> <laughs> we did it, man. <laughs> we did it fast. Okay. So when you render the image that I, I simulate, you're gonna see that the sun is closer to the camera, so that is why you have the the, the clouds illuminating there. You have the reflection on the water, and when I make the the sun go away, play. Um, and render that image, you're going to see that the sun's, uh, the, the cloud is going to get darker because, of course, the light source is going away. So you can see now that the front clouds are darker and the uh, back layer of the cloud is illuminated, like in real life happened, right? So when you uh, start to make a zoom, like a P900 uh, uh, does, you know, take a look that this is the sun, all right? always is on top of the cloud layer, always. It's never going to be uh, down of the cloud layer. So when you render with this zoom, you can start to see the light of the sun that reacts like in the real life because I set up this kind of uh, refractive atmosphere. So the sun is up, but the, in the render mode is cut off. Why does happen? Uh, put a pause there, one pause, okay. Anybody that tried to debunk uh, using 3D computer programs, uh, they forgot to compute the atmospheric, the optical thing. They present us like a, only the geometrical thing. So if you take out all the air, we don't have any kind of index of refraction. So the image is gonna be just like a geometrical is presented. So when you start to add in these uh, real things, uh, you're gonna, have this kind of uh, uh, simulations uh, play. So here you can see how the sun cut off, but it's on top of the cloud layer. So the computer reproduced the same thing that's happened on the real life. And here we have a comparison uh, based on, you know, uh, homemade uh, models, the computer model and the real life model and all match because all, if you take this image here, you can see that the, how the glass and the water reacts like the atmosphere does, right? So it's very simple. I mean, the sun is really a go away and shrink in size. You're never going to detect it if you film a sunset with a zoom totally, uh, you know, in the full zoom, because when you make zoom, the image compress and you lose perspective. But if you just leave the camera with the zoom uh, off, and you film it, you're going to have this kind of images when clearly you can see clearly how the suns shrink. So if the suns shrink, uh, it's because it's far away, right? So 
One of the things that uh, yeah. No, no, go on. Hello. Oh, John, John Abizade. If you've ever read his book, one of the things I thought was one of the best experiments was he said that the sun is never below your feet; it's always above your head. And his example for that was you could get a house on any mountain, and you know how we've all seen sun rays come in through the bedroom window. That at no time will you ever find sun rays coming in hitting the ceiling of a room. And it's so true. So for everybody yeah. who believes they live on a globe, many times the sun would be below your feet, in which case the light would come in and hit the ceiling of your house. But it's never been shown ever. So yeah, a good good example. Two, two minutes more, please. Two minutes more and, and, and I finished. So keep playing. All right. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> we won't rush you out of here again. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Okay, okay, I'm gonna relax soon now. Okay, you go play, please. So here you can see full screen samples uh, taken from the real life, how the, the clouds is gonna change always um, the size, of course, of the sun, because uh, if you don't have any cloud, you don't have much distortion, just the index of refraction of the air. And pause here. So here is what you can see here is, uh, pause, 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 pause. Okay, thank you. So here you can see, of course, the seashore. You can see uh, the sea line on the horizon. My left face, I will please go up, please. Yeah. This is the, 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 this is the, okay. All right, here. This is the dark bay, though, okay. So um, if you can notice here, that part of the image, which is, you know, come the spherical shape and then turn into line because if it's any cloud you don't have reference to detect the fata morgana line so maybe you get confused but in this kind of situation you can see how the spherical shapes ended at that point here sorry for my <laughs> noisy hand uh, that part there which is turned in a straight line that is where you can detect the fata morgana if you don't have any other reference and the nice about this image if you can play again is that this is, of course, it's on the sun, it's the moon. So the moon is at the same height of the sun, at the same size of the sun, because all these lights are projected in the uh, karma line. Mm -hmm. So maybe they are in the different uh, altitude, and that is why the eclipse is happening. But for our point of view, we, we see in that big screen called the atmosphere. And uh, that is how this works. And I try to replicate also, the, because a lot of people believe that the sun uh, is uh, uh, interpret, interpreted on the clouds, behind the clouds, and that kind of stuff. And so that we live in a matrix because it's a simulator in the sun and this kind right. of thing. For me, you know, um, when you're talking about artificial things, the word artificial has a, a really uh, profound meaning because being artificial is being they have an, uh, you know, a, a creator, an artifice. I don't know how it's pronounced in English, but artificial is, is come from someone made it. It's not a virtual object. It's someone made it. That is the artifices, you know, the artist who made that. So if you're talking about uh, the sun is an artificial thing, of course, someone make it. <laughs> That's a, it's an artificial. Another thing is, no, it's a virtual reality. Anyone can believe whatever they want, but uh, uh, for me, it's artificial if you think in that uh, kind of terms. So here what I did is, this layer is the same as the model that I present. And here you can see the spot because the light will be up here, you know, going in the straight line. All the time is going in the straight line. Um, but the, the thing is, the source of the light is very bright, very bright. And the clouds are volumetric objects. They are not solid objects. So if you have volumetric object, uh, that uh, properties that this object have is let the light pass through, right? So the clouds are not so thick uh, in the atmosphere. So put a pause here. Look at the, the simulation when, that you're going to see is like the, the sun is in between of these clouds, but here you can see that the, the, this is just the sun, the, the, the light source. It's not a real object interpenetrated the, the, the layer of the cloud, but 
uh, if you look visually, you're going to see like the sun or the moon is in between this cloud, but uh, play. But if you take, a, for example, I'm going to take a, you know, how, you see how these clouds start to mix in with the light of the sun. And if you take a exposure level, because this render of the image was in a, a 32 bit following point. So you have all the light information. So if I start to decrease the exposure, you can see how the clouds are coming again, like in the real life. You can see the camera when it's uh, automatic exposure can start to work. You can see the suns in the front. So that is why the, why the people get a lot of confusion about uh, how the light works, how the light interact with volumetric objects. Here you can see a homemade uh, experiment with you have this film strip in front of a light, but when you turn it on. The film strip is have these properties of um, it's like a volumetric object because it's not totally solid object. So here you can see it, and the film strip always is in front. But you, you know, the, the image uh, that you perceive is like this film strip are behind, but always is on top. And the next one. The next. Uh, Okay, um, play. And this is, for me, is very important thing because uh, there is a phenomena in the physics, in the optic called anisotrophic lighting. Uh, that means that uh, one, one uh, point of light um, is can be uh, spread in the spherical shape or in a linear shape. So look at here. What I did was, this is the solar light. And the solar light, I move it in the straight line. So if you are inside of this uh, glass dome and you look up at 12 o'clock, you're going to see always the sun uh, on your head, right? But as we get uh, the sunset, it's coming, you're going to see how the light start to bend in. But the light is always in a straight line and you're going to see bending because the atmosphere reacts in that manner. You know, uh, I show you uh, real examples of that. So. When you start to uh, tweak in this uh, project, look at how the light, one single light, start to create this shape of a spherical shape like, like, like in the real life. Because the atmosphere has the anisotropic properties. Mm -hmm. So if the conditions are good, you're going to see this kind of phenomena that uh, um, it's because the atmosphere is like a glass. Uh, there is no doubt about it. You know, you have the examples on computer, on home-based model, on the real life, uh, the famous sun dogs, uh, showing how these uh, properties of the atmosphere are um, presented uh, in the real life. And they took all these kind of things and they say, okay, this is the curve. I'm going to present the curve. And it's a curve, but this is a curving of the light. Look at this, is a 360, 360 sun dog. Which is the sun? This one or that one? Or that one? You know, and that is this is the real curve. Is the the light it's getting bent. So that is why you're never gonna see a geometrical curve. And the last one is um, uh, you know, some people believe uh, because pause 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 pause. pause. <laughs> okay, so a lot of people believe that when you are, uh, you know, they say, okay, I know, but you can see twice the sunset because if you are on the ground and see the sun goes by, then you go up and see again. So because, you know, you see more far away on the curve, mm -hmm. like, like you see the earth, measure, you know, two meters, something like that. Mm -hmm. But when you, I have the same setup that I show early and uh, what I did was moving the sun as an object, you can see how the clouds touch the horizon, but the cloud is always on top. But we have that refractive properties play. So you're gonna see how the suns move very, very fast and uh, it's gonna to disappear on the horizon and you rise up, it's gonna appear again. And this is a flat horizon because the computer uses an algorithm that computes a flat surface and you have the same phenomena. So 
And there is no doubt that the, the things up in the sky, uh, they are moving. We are totally still and they get uh, far away. Uh, and uh, that's, that's it, they get far away. All right, everybody. Well, that that is our show, and uh, we're really glad you came out to see us, and and I'm really happy that uh, Iru got a chance to do this. Uh, many of you know that uh, we brought Iru here from Argentina. And we crowdfunded his uh, plane tickets and everything to bring him here on the Globuster show. And I got to tell you, that's one of the best moves I ever made with starting that. that. <laughs> All right, so that's it for us. Um, thank you for coming out. We are the Globusters, and uh, join us Sunday uh, at noon Pacific, every Sunday. Not and Sunday. But not this Sunday, starting <laughs> next Sunday. Yeah, yeah. The, this Sunday we'll still be schmoozing with you guys here. So. <laughs> All right, thanks, thanks a lot, everybody. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Great move. Great move. Good move, man.